I have a story for you. I think you're going to enjoy it. It's called Two Wolves. It's about a little boy. His name is an Indian boy. His name is Two Feathers. And Two Feathers was fighting with all the children at school and getting in all kinds of battles, some verbal, some with his fists. Grandfather came to talking to him. Grandfather's name was Broken Tail. He was worried about Two Feathers, and he says, you know, I need to talk to him to let him know the old story. So he goes up to Two Feathers and he says, I have a story to read to you, Two Feathers. It's a beautiful evening. Please sit down and talk with me. So Two Feathers sits down and got, Grandfather says, One evening an old Cherokee Indian told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people, and he meant all people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil, it's angry, envious, full of jealousy and sorrow. He's greedy, self, has self-pity, he resents everyone, he lies, he has false pride and ego. Then, son, there's another wolf. His name is Good. He's full of joy and peace, love, hope. He always tells the truth and is very humble. He has kindness, empathy, generosity, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a while, and he says, But grandfather, who wins the fights? And grandfather says, the one that you feed. Grandson, there was a young boy that I used to know, and he was going through the same thing you're going through. He hated everybody. He, nobody ever bullied him because he was the bully. He went about beating on others for no reason. But grandfather, they called me names because of my name. Two feathers. I wish I'd never been named that. And he, grandfather says, well, that's the name you were given because the, just at the moment that you were born, two feathers fell from the sky right in front of your mother. So that's the way we name our children. And besides, son, I want you to think about what the story you just heard about Jesus and what he's done for us. Two feathers bowed his head, and he started thinking more, and he said, grandfather, I remember Oh, I feel so sad about what I've been doing. I want to feed the good wolf, Grandfather. How do I change? What do you think Grandfather's answer was? Be like Jesus. I'll just tell you what I'm thinking of. How do you meet Jesus? How do you get to know him? How do you change? Well, number one, you have to pray to him and ask him to be a part of your life. Isn't that true? Yeah. Jesus has done so much for me in my life when I reached out to him. He has changed me a hundred times over, and I'm still growing. And I praise God for that. And that's what, just what grandfather told his son. He says, guess who that other boy was that I knew so long ago? It was me. Yes, it was grandfather. He was acting the same way when he was his uh, two feathers age. So remember, we don't have to be the way that we are if we don't like being that way. And we can learn to grow and how to be kinder to people, even the ones who are not so nice back, if we will pray and ask Jesus to help us. Thank you very much for listening. And could we say a quick prayer together? Would you like to pray? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you've done in our lives. You're a wonderful God, and we want very much to serve you. So we ask that you would walk with us today. You would speak to our hearts. Help us to hear you and respond to you. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
after the service today, I encourage everyone to come up and smell these flowers. <laughs> they are amazing. You can just smell them. I smelled them when I was down there. It just gives you that sp spring is here, you know, feeling. Um, our scripture reading today comes from John 10, 11, 12. And this is Jesus speaking. And he says, he's holding his staff, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives, lays down his life for his sheep. But the hired man, the hired help, he is a shepherd, but he does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf, he runs away. He abandons the sheep. Why? Because he fears for his own life. But the Lord would never do that, of course. So the wolf sees that the sheep are unattended. So he attacks them, and they scatter. And the thir chap and verse 13 says, why does a hired man run away? Because he cares nothing about the sheep. I want to welcome today our speaker. He will be our speaker for the next three more Sabbaths, and we are blessed to have him. Eric Flickinger, he is the associate, pass or associate speaker from It Is Written, and... Um, he also does a, he hosts a weekly Sabbath school program, but they don't have him for the next four weeks. We have him. What a blessing. So with that, welcome, Eric. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you, Carla. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I am delighted to be here this morning with you and to share a message with you. Just, just out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many of you were here last night? All right, that is just about everybody. Fantastic. Well, we're glad that you're back here again this morning. And this morning's message, as you can see up on the screen, is the War of the Wolves. So what is that about? What is the War of the Wolves, and why is that significant for what we're doing during the course of these meetings over the course of the next few weeks? Well, we're going to find out here momentarily. And by the grace of God, this is going to be an encouragement. Uh, perhaps we'll challenge you just a little bit. How many of you like to be challenged by a sermon? Well, it's about half of you. I'm encouraged. <laughs> but by the grace of God, this will encourage you and challenge you and be very, be very applicable for what's going on uh, right now. In fact, as you're well aware, this, these meetings are going on all across Treasure Valley and beyond. Eastern uh, Oregon is having meetings and all across uh, Treasure Valley and so forth. We've got uh, Pastor John Bradshaw and Pastor Wes Peppers who are over at Nampa. And we have Pastor Douglas Naa, who's also uh, who's the director of our SALT program, who's speaking here. So this is, this is really a, 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 and how would you say this? A full court press by It Is Written. We have all of our speakers out here speaking at these locations, and so we're really privileged to be here in the Idaho Conference and sharing with you, locking arms with you in bringing the gospel to this area. So this morning's message goes right along with that, and it is the war of the wolves. So I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin. Father, we want to thank you for the privilege that you give us of sharing the gospel message. We were encouraged last night by the many people who came, and we ask that you will bless again this evening, and that not just everyone who came last night, but even more people will come tonight, so that they may also have the opportunity of hearing this message of hope and encouragement from you. We also ask that you will encourage and inspire us to come, so that not only will we be blessed, but we have the opportunity to be a blessing to others and to encourage them on their walk. Please be with us this morning as we open your word. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned, this morning's message is called The War of the Wolves. From far and wide, the faithful made their way to the dusty Galilean hillside. 
As the sun shone down, groups of three and four and five began to converge upon the site. They made their way to this site for, uh, by circuitous routes, hoping, to, uh, hoping not to excite the suspicion of the jealous Jews. Soon a crowd of over 500 people had gathered on the hillside and they began to gather themselves together in little knots and to speak of all that they had seen and heard of Jesus. The disciples passed from group to group and they shared what they knew about Jesus. Now everyone there knew that Jesus had been crucified, that he died. Many of them though believed that he had risen again and they all waited with eager anticipation to see if Jesus would show up. Suddenly, Jesus stood among them. Nobody knew where he came from or how he got there. But as the groups began to press toward him, Jesus began to speak. And the words that he spoke lifted the hearts of the listeners above the earthly and the temporal to the heavenly and the eternal. I want to share with you this morning the words that Jesus spoke that day so long ago. Open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 18. Matthew 28, verse... In verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, or all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Clothed with boundless authority, Jesus gives this commission to his listeners. He's about to ascend to the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven, and he gives this, this talk, this speech, this great commission to those whom he is about to leave. Take a look at verses 19 and 20. In verse 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, it's interesting, in a book called The Desire of Ages, the author speaks of this meeting on this dusty Galilean hillside and this great commission that Jesus speaks to his followers. Here's what the author says on page 822 of The Desire of Ages. The Savior's commission to the disciples included all the believers. It includes all believers in Christ to the end of time. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow man. For this work the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ." So who does that great commission apply to? Everybody, all of us, all Christians everywhere, including those of us who are gathered here today. Now, very shortly after giving this great commission, Christ ascended into heaven. On the day, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out in a marked way to give Christ's followers the gifts that they would need in order to spread the gospel to the world. <clears throat> Soon, however... Divisions came in among the Christian groups, and there were heresies, there were misrepresentations of truth, and problems began to bubble up in the Christian churches. There was strife, and there was dissension, and you read about these things in Paul's letters to the churches in Corinth, in Galatia, in Thessalonica. These divisions continued down into the days of the Protestant Reformation, and individuals like Martin Luther and his contemporaries were having to try to deal with this as well and to try to bring Christianity back together. One of Martin Luther's contemporaries was a man by the name of Melanchthon. And Melanchthon endeavored to try to bring the Christians back together again by traveling around and sharing with them a story called the War of the Wolves. And here's how that story went. The wolves were somewhat afraid of the dogs because the dogs were many and strong. 
And so the wolves sent out a spy among the dogs to see what they could learn about the enemy. When the spy returned, he gave this report. It's true, he said, that the dogs are many and strong, but there are very few mastiffs among them. In fact, there are so many different kinds of dogs that they fight among one another and they make a lot of noise, but very few of them even know how to bite. But that didn't cheer me nearly as much as this, the spy said. As I saw the dogs marching on to war, even though they hate us, the wolves, yet each dog snaps left and right at his brothers. And that's evidence that he hates his brothers even more. You know, it's something for us to think about, something for us to ponder. We also, as Christians, ought to be saving our teeth for the wolves, not for one another. Amen? That story helped many people to realize exactly where we are. When we look at our lives as Christians, where are we headed? What are we doing to advance the gospel? Now, we're doing something very tangible right now over the course of the next several weeks in bringing these great reset meetings to Meridian and the area around. This war that Melanchthon was speaking of, the war between the wolves and the dogs, actually had its origin a long, long time ago. Let's go take a look at the origins of this war over in the book of Revelation. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 7. <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 7, a familiar verse with you, I would expect, it says this, And war broke out where? In heaven, the most unlikely of places to expect a war. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. This war has carried down to our time as well. As soon as a church begins to engage actively in evangelism, they are in essence declaring war on the devil. And as soon as they declare war on the devil, guess what the devil does? He declares war on them. And as soon as the devil declares war on a church that is actively trying to reach souls, you can expect that there are going to be challenges and problems because the devil excels at those things. He does not want the gospel to go forward. Now drop down to verse number 17, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It says, and the dragon, who is the dragon here? That's Satan. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman represent? Represents the church. The dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman, the church, and he went to make what? To make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil does not want people to tell the world about Jesus. He does not want people to have the opportunity to get to know Jesus, to receive Jesus as their Savior. And so he does whatever he can to try to prevent the churches from sharing that gospel. Now, if the devil is like a wolf, how does a wolf attack a flock of sheep? Does a wolf just attack the entire flock, or does he have a different uh, strategy that he uses? The strategy they typically use is one that is called divide and conquer. The devil will single out one sheep and kill it. And then he'll come back and he'll single out another sheep and kill it. So if we know the devil's strategy, if the devil is out to devour one by one, John 10 verse 12 says the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. That's the way the devil works. So if we know the devil's strategy, his desire is to divide us and conquer us and take us down one by one. What should we do in order to prevent him from doing that? If he wants to divide us, what do we need to do? We need to press together. Press together, press together. This is from volume five of the testimonies, page number 488. 
Let each one who claims to follow Christ esteem himself less and others more. Press together, press together. In union there is strength and victory. In discord and division there is weakness and defeat. Now in the work of soul winning, of evangelism, there are many different attacks that the devil tries to do in order to derail the efforts of the church in sharing the gospel. I've seen it happen many, many times over the last several decades. One of the things that the devil loves to do to prevent the gospel going forward is to foul up the delivery of the handbills. We've sent tens of thousands of handbills to the community around the church here. And sometimes what happens is the postal carriers look at this big stack of handbills that they need to deliver to everybody in the community, and they've already got plenty of other mail that they need to deliver. So sometimes, sadly, what happens is they take that stack of handbills and they find a nearby trash can, and in it goes. And people never even learn about the meetings. That's happened before. Sometimes what happens is if we're renting a meeting hall, now we happen to be meeting in the church here, so I'm less concerned that it's going to cancel, but sometimes when we meet in a meeting hall, just before the meetings begin, after the handbills have all gone out, the meeting hall calls up and says, yeah, sorry, you know, we said you could meet here, but we've changed our mind and we're not going to let you meet here anymore. Do you think that causes any problems if you've already sent all the handbills out, tens of thousands of handbills, and now your location cancels on you? That can cause problems. Sometimes the devil causes uprisings in the community. I was over in the Philippines a few years ago. And during the time that I was over there, there was an uprising against the government. And people were charging the presidential palace in order to try to get the president out of power. And people were being shot and killed just a couple of miles away from where our site was that we were holding the meetings. And we were concerned that they were going to uh, set up martial law and would cut down the meetings and everything. And by the grace of God, things continued to go forward and thousands of people were baptized. But the most effective strategy that the devil uses is not one of those. It's to create discord and division within the evangelistic team or the church. That's the most effective strategy that the devil uses. Now, I share this with you this morning, not because I have seen that here, but as a warning that the devil will try that. So when you see discord and division happening, recognize this is the work of the adversary. He's the one who is doing this, and don't participate in it. What did we find the council was? To do what? Press together, press together. I want to share with you this morning five reasons to strive for unity within the evangelistic team or the church. How many reasons? Five reasons. So if you want to take some notes, I will not prevent you from doing that. Here are five reasons to strive for unity within the evangelistic team or the church. Reason number one is that unity is strength. What is reason number one? Unity is strength. Turn over in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Here's what it says in Ecclesiastes 4, verse number 9. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by, two, by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is what? is not quickly broken. When you have three together, it's difficult to break. But when one or two are alone, it becomes more and more difficult. Mark chapter 3, verse 25, Jesus addresses this, and he says, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot what? It cannot stand. 
If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. We will never become a church that effectively reaches out to the lost, to those who are missing out, if we shoot our wounded and major and minors. Instead of being the fishers of men that Christ has called us to be, we will find ourselves the keepers of an ever-shrinking aquarium. God has called us to be fishers of men. How many of you have ever noticed in the fall formations of large birds that fly overhead heading south? Have you noticed those before? What type of birds do you frequently see flying overhead? Geese. You hear geese, right? How do you usually know that a flock of geese is approaching? You hear the honking, don't you? You know, scientists have studied this. They've looked at why geese fly in this V formation. They found some very interesting things. You know, when a goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift in the air behind it. And so the geese that are on the trailing edges of the V are able to ride on that uplift, and they are able to achieve at least 71% greater distance by flying in formation. As we work together, we can go a whole lot further too. So here are four lessons we can learn from geese. Lesson number one, when a goose falls out of formation, he feels the strain of going it alone. Now he doesn't have the uplift of everyone else that he can ride on. He's going under his own strength and his own power, and he's not able to go nearly as far or nearly as fast as if he had stayed in formation with everyone else. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, when a goose gets tired, he falls out of the lead formation, the lead in the formation, the front of the V, and he takes up a position on the trailing edge of the V in order to regain his strength. There's maybe something we can learn about that in church as well. Some positions in church take a toll on people. Maybe it's a head elder or a head deacon or a head deaconess or a Sabbath school superintendent or something like that. And over and over again, as that person is tasked with those responsibilities, it can begin to take a toll and wear a person down. It's not inappropriate from time to time for a person to step out of that position and regain their strength while someone else picks up the mantle for a while. Then once they've regained their strength again, step back into that position and be an even more effective leader. That's a second lesson we can learn from geese. Third lesson we can learn from geese. How do you know that a flock of geese is flying overhead? Typically, you just told me, what do you do? You, you listen, you hear them, right? you hear the honking. Now, scientists, again, have studied this, and they've tried to figure out who's honking. They found out it's not the geese in the lead that are doing the honking. The ones that are doing the honking are the ones on the trailing edge of the V. Do you know what their honking does, what the purpose of their honking is? It's encouragement to the ones at the front. They're encouraging them, keep going. You can do it. They're honking encouragement from behind. Now, when you and I honk at someone from behind, <laughs> what message are we sending to them? They get out of the way, right? It's a little different message, isn't it? Lesson number four that we can learn from geese. When a goose gets sick or wounded, and ends up having to fall to the ground, it's not uncommon for a couple of other geese to join them. And those other geese will stay with the sick or wounded goose until either that goose regains its strength or dies. What if we stuck by our wounded members like that? If somebody in church was sick or, or hurt or felt abandoned, what if we stuck by them just like that? people would push down the walls of this church to get in here if that's the way that we dealt with sick and wounded members. You know, really, honestly, to, to grow the church of Christ, all we have to do is have the sense of a goose 
That's it, the sense of a goose, and we could do this work so much more effectively. Four lessons from geese. Let's come back to our second reason to strive for unity. Second reason to strive for unity is that we may answer the prayer of Christ. I want to invite you to turn to John 17, verse 11, to answer the prayer of Christ. Let's look at Christ's prayer. John chapter 17 and verse number 11. In John 17, verse number 11, Jesus says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be what? That they may be what? One as we are. Drop down also to verse number 21. Verse 21, Jesus says, that they all may be what? One, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that what? That you sent me. Christ's prayer is that his children, his people, would be one. When we unify with one another, when we come close to one another to do the work of Christ, we are, at, we are actually answering the prayer of Christ. So that's the second reason that we strive for unity. The third reason that we strive for unity is that the world may believe in Jesus. Go backwards just a couple of chapters to John 13. John chapter 13, we're looking at the third reason to strive for unity, and that is that the world may believe in Jesus. John chapter 13, look at verses 34 and 35. John 13, 34 and 35. Verse 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have what? Love for one another. In a very interesting passage in the ninth volume of the Testimonies, page 194, here's what it says. Unity existing among the followers of Christ is an evidence that the Father has sent His Son to save sinners. It is a witness to His power, for nothing short of the miraculous power of God can bring human beings with their different temperaments together in harmonious action, their one aim being to speak the truth in love. That's the strongest evidence to the world that God is at work in His children. Because we are all so different. We have different backgrounds, different upbringings, different cultures, different economic levels, all kinds of differences. And yet, despite all those differences, when we have Jesus in our hearts, we're able to come together and to unify with one another. So let me ask you, is it possible for people with so many different backgrounds to unite, yes or no? Yes, it is. You know what it takes, though? It takes a miracle. Fortunately for you and me, that's the business that God is in. He performs miracles. Here's reason number four. Reason number four to strive for unity is that we may have the Holy Spirit. What is reason number four? That we may have the Holy Spirit. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? The Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So when they all came together, they were all united. They were all, as it says, in one accord. Then the Holy Spirit was poured out on them in a marked way. And what was the result 
of Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. How many people were baptized that day? 3,000 people. 3,000 people were baptized when they all came together and were in one accord. Is the Holy Spirit any less able to work today than He was able to work 2,000 years ago? No, He's just as able to work today. But we need to come together in unity and to press forward and to take on the, the mantle that Jesus has given us to go and share the gospel with the world. Do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible that at the end of these meetings that we're doing, 3,000 people could be baptized? Do you think that's possible, yes or no? Ah, I'm getting a little more enthusiasm there, right? Yes, it's possible. Absolutely it's possible. There's no reason that it couldn't be possible. But we have to be a part of that, every one of us. Because when we come together, that makes it more possible for God to do what He wants to do when He sees His children come together. Were the disciples united prior to the day of Pentecost? Before the day of Pentecost? No, you remember the story of what was going on? You know, you had James and John who were, their mother was saying, oh, you know, can you make them the, the ones that sit on the right hand and the left hand when you, when you ascend into heaven, Jesus? Can you do that? How'd that go over with the other disciples? Not real well, right? And Peter wanted, you know, well, Peter had his issues. Bless Peter's heart, right? How many of you have ever found yourself a little bit like Peter in the Bible? He gives us encouragement. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be surrendered. That's it. If we can be surrendered, He can do great things through us. Here's reason number five. Reason number five to strive for unity is that we may be used by God to win souls. Reason number five, that we may be used by God to win souls. Turn over to John 10. Back just a book. John chapter 10 we're going to look at verse number 16. John 10, verse 16. In John 10, verse 16, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be how many flocks? One flock, and how many shepherds? One shepherd. Jesus says he has other children out there, and they're going to hear his voice. And when they do, they're going to be looking for the right flock to be in because they know the right shepherd to follow. How many of you believe that this is the right flock? That means that Jesus is going to be bringing people here. And we saw evidence of that last night, didn't we? We saw lots of people in this place. But were there still some empty seats, yes or no? Yes, there were. Do you think God wants to fill those seats? Yes, He does. Who do you think He wants to use to help fill those seats? Us. He wants us to reach out to people, to invite them. I trust that you've invited many people already. Some of them may have come last night. Some of them may not have. Don't be concerned if they didn't come. Give them another invitation. On average, it takes about six or seven invitations for a person to come to a meeting like this. Six or seven. Now, that doesn't mean that you should call them seven times today. But if you've invited them before and they haven't come, give them a call today. Shoot them an email. Give them a text. You know, say, hey, you missed a really great meeting last night. It's not too late to come We've got some great things that are coming. Come tonight and you will be thrilled. How many of you learned at least a little, a little something new last night? It's just about every hand. People are going to learn new things when they come as well. And let me, let me share something interesting with you here. This is from volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 182. Speaking of the adversary... 
While he seeks to unite his agents in warring against the truth, he will work to divide and scatter its advocates. Now, just for clarification's sake, who are the advocates of the truth that he's talking about here, that they're talking about here? Us. That's, that's who's being described here. While he, the adversary, seeks to unite his agents in warring against the truth, he will work to divide and scatter its advocates. How? Here's how. Jealousy, evil surmising, evil speaking are instigated by him to produce discord and dissension. The members of Christ's church have the power to thwart the purpose of the adversary of souls. At such a time as this, let them not be found at variance with one another or with any of the Lord's workers. Amidst the general discord, let there be one place where harmony and unity exist because the Bible is made the guide of life. How many of you are grateful that the Bible is the guide of life? That's the guide that we're using every night at the seminar. That's the guide that you use every day in your life. And if that's the guide, then we should expect to see, and we do, a unity among our members. No discord, no division, no evil surviving, no evil speaking, no jealousy. So when you begin to see that, and I say when, not if, when you begin to see that happening here, Recognize it for what it is. Identify it for what it is. It's the work of the adversary. His purpose is to thwart God's work. And if you see or hear it happening, don't participate in it. Steer clear of it and unite with all of God's workers. Amen? Now, what's going to be the end result of that? Turn to Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse number 14. Matthew 24, verse 14 says this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in part of the world as a witness to some of the nations, and then the end might come. I I got one person who argued with me on that. That's not what it says, is it? You got to pay attention to preachers. They'll try to sneak stuff in there that's not in the Bible. That's not what your Bible says, is it? Your Bible says something very different, doesn't it? You ever hear a preacher trying to pull some stunt like that? You call him on it. That's not what your Bible says. It says, in this gospel of the kingdom, what? Will or shall be preached in how much of the world? All the world as a witness for how many nations? All the nations, and then the end will come. The Bible tells us that the gospel is going to go to all the world. And then the end will come. So what does that mean? How many of you would like to see the end come? All right. So if the end is going to come, what has to happen first? The gospel has to go to all the world. And all the world includes where? Right here in Meridian. And who is Jesus wanting to use actively to share the gospel with others? Us. All of us. We have an awesome opportunity, an incredible privilege to see God at work. And I believe we saw God at work here last night. How many of you believe that? Do you think God's done here? I don't think so either. I think we got a phenomenal start by the grace of God. But I think he also has a lot more that he wants to do, and he wants to do that through us. So I want to encourage you to do two things, two things. Number one, come to every meeting that you possibly can, because your presence here will speak loudly to everyone else who comes that this is the most important place on earth right now to be by your, simply your presence being here, by being in one of the seats. So the first thing I want to do is encourage you, come to as many as you can. It will make a difference that you cannot begin to comprehend. Make a huge difference for you to be here. The second thing that I want to encourage you to do, invite somebody else. Don't keep the blessing to yourself. If you've already invited some people, 
invite them again. If maybe somebody in the back of your mind says, I, pre- I really ought to invite this people. I just haven't had the, this person. I really haven't had the right opportunity. I, I just hadn't worked out. Invite them. Give them a call. Shoot them a text. Leave them a message. Send them a, a link to the website. Great meetings. You don't want to miss it. So come yourself and bring a friend. And just imagine when you make it to heaven and that person is there because of you. How do you think that's going to make you feel? How many of you know some people that you're pretty certain if Jesus came tomorrow, they would not be ready to meet him? Okay. Let's give them that opportunity. This is, this is an incredible opportunity over the course of the next few weeks. doesn't happen every day of the week. God's bringing everything together right now to make it as easy as possible, and we saw evidence of him working here last night. So I want to encourage you, be encouraged. God is at work. How many of you are excited to see God at work and want to be a part of that? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we recognize that we are part of a great war. That war is happening in a very real way right here in Meridian right now. That war is happening in the hearts of people in this community who have received the invitations, who've seen the handbills, who've seen the billboards, who've seen the ads pop up on Facebook and Instagram, and there's a struggle going on in their hearts, whether they should come or not. We ask that your spirit would win in that struggle and that they would come to hear these words of life. We also recognize that that battle is very much going on in our own hearts and in our own churches as well. For one reason or another, from time to time, the adversary gets a toehold and causes people to doubt or to become jealous of one thing or another, to create discord and division. We don't want to see that happen here, Father. And so we ask that you would work on each of us individually and corporately so that we might we might exude the love of Christ to others. May the people who come night by night see the unity of your family members here in this church, and may that speak loudly to them that you are present here. We ask that you will give us encouragement and strength to clear our calendars so that we can come and be a part of your work that's going on and help us to have the strength and the fortitude to to barrel through so that we can see your hand at work at the very end. We ask your blessing, your strength, and your power in each one of us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do stay by and join us for lunch um, out that way and to the right. Follow your nose. It'll smell like potatoes. We'll see you there momentarily.